Well, hello, and welcome back to the 6-5 Summit. I'm Shelley Kramer, one of the founding partners of Futurum Research, and on behalf of our team at Futurum and the team at More Insights, we're really glad to have you. In this fireside chat discussion, Futurum's Daniel Newman sits down with Splunk CTO Tim Tully and Ram Sriharsha, their head of machine learning. The topic they're going to tackle today is the role machine learning can play in helping companies get the most out of their data. But before we get started, a little bit about Splunk. Splunk is all about turning machine data into answers. Customers use a variety of Splunk solutions to solve their toughest IT, internet, and security challenges. If getting to your aha moment when it comes to getting the most out of your data is what you're seeking, this is one conversation I can promise you, you won't want to miss. Let's get to it. Hey, Ram and Tim. Welcome to the 6.5 Summit. How are you gentlemen doing today? Doing great. Doing great, yeah. Really great to, to have you here. Excited to have this conversation. Uh, you know, earlier we heard about uh, Doug, we heard from Doug Merritt, your CEO, about Splunk's vision to bring data to everything. You know, Splunk is, is definitely showing that uh, machine learning as a platform is, is critical. It's been a part of the company's investments over the last several years uh, under his leadership and under your leadership. Um, you know, the, the separation into IT and security has given you guys a, a clearer vision going forward um, and has really sort of helped your core customers evolve, but also has helped you guys acquire new customers. Um, and, and so with this in mind, you know, this session being a little more technical, uh, you guys really driving forces within the company behind the tech, behind the, the AI machine learning. Um, I'm going to I'm going to hop right into my, my first question. And, uh, you know, uh, Ram, I'll, I'll put this one to you first. Or actually, you know what, Tim, I'm going to do you first. Um, tell us how you and the team have evolved the way uh, Splunk is thinking about machine learning. Yeah, I think um, when I when I first stepped into the role here at, at Splunk, what we were doing was a uh, you know, a lot of machine learning that was sort of, I would say, behind the scenes. Um, it would power a lot of IT and security use cases in our in our products. Um, we had in particular one product called User Behavior Analytics um, that you know not, is not using machine learning as as much as we'd like, but it, it sort of insinuates that it is, and you know we're making adjustments to that a, a, as we go. I, I think the approach that we're starting to take now is to be much more overt about our approach with the machine learning rather than it powering specific use cases sort of behind the scenes in a way that say Netflix movie recommendation does, right? It recommends movies. It's this is a bunch of ML behind the scenes, but you don't, it's not sort of in your face about it. Um, we're trying to do much better, probably along two fronts. One is we have a very concerted effort around machine learning um, in, the, in the stream, which I'm sure Rom is, is happy to, to describe in much more gory detail. Than, than I will. And then I, I think our approach to uh, what I would loosely call um, our data science workbench, which was called MLTK uh, historically, um, that was uh, essentially a data science workbench that ran within the context of a, of a Splunk app. So most Splunk apps today are essentially renditions of our dashboarding framework. Um, we do a really good job of making them feel like proper apps. Um, this is a, a totally different approach that we're going to start to take. Um, we probably aren't going to share too many details in this in this session here, and so that we can save some ammo for our, our user conference in October. Um, but what we're, what we're doing there will be very familiar to data scientists. Uh, I think they'll be really happy to to see uh, sort of the changes that we've made there. So, um, really, in summary, we're we're really making ML part to be uh, begin to be part of the sort of the forefront of what we do as a company rather than something that's behind the scenes. Yeah, that, that's um, really interesting. Second of all, Tim, we're okay if you want to, you know, make the 6.5 Summit a launch point for some new products and services. <laughs> that wasn't really what we did. This is all about thought leadership. But hey, if you want to surprise the audience and, and drop a new product, I mean, why would you use your conference if you could use ours? Yeah, I mean, Doug will beat me up and no, <laughs> I, I think we'll, we'll hold that one back, man. Sorry. All right. I will... Um, we will wait anxiously for that. But uh, Ram, uh, can you talk us through a little bit more of the baseline of how Splunk thinks differently uh, about machine learning, and then perhaps you know share a few examples? Because you know, I think people always digest this stuff better when they can see it through the lens of a customer instead of just how the technology itself works. Yeah. So uh, I think Tim, Tim alluded to this uh, 
in three broad categories. So uh, one thing we are doing uh, differently now than before is uh, embedding machine learning very fundamentally into some uh, areas where it is typically not been embedded. A lot of Splunk is about processing raw logs, right? Um, extracting content out of logs, enriching them so that you can perform rich analysis downstream. Uh, one of the things we are doing here is actually embedding machine learning and natural language processing techniques directly as you are reading logs. So you can automate the process of field extractions and things that are very messy and traditionally machine learning has not been applied to. But that's fundamentally a different thing that we're doing. Uh, and this is also state of the art in the sense that there aren't good ways to do this today, uh, period. Uh, the other thing Tim alluded to is uh, the data science workbench. And again, I can't go into that too much here. Uh, however, we are vastly expanding the capabilities that our previous uh, machine learning toolkit provided. Uh, and uh, in a sense, both scaling it out in terms of how much data it can process, how complex computations it can do, but also how familiar it is to uh, existing personas in Splunk. For example, if you are security content authors or if you are IT ops, Dev uh, DevOps folks and so on, it will be a very natural interface for you that seamlessly mixes SPL and machine learning. Uh, if you are a data scientist, it's an extremely natural interface for you as well. So we are. Uh, so this is something very novel, I think. Uh, and and finally, uh, there is a lot of use cases in uh, Splunk, and a lot of customers do it today, where they need to perform machine learning on the screen. So in a sense, they actually need to learn from data on the screen. Uh, this is true whether you are in security, where it's pretty obviously uh, important uh, to be able to notice changes in patterns sooner than later. Uh, but even in IT and operations use cases, you want to be able to track metrics and you want to be able to adapt to changes in your environment uh, sooner and in as automated a manner as possible. Uh, this is worse today than before simply because we collect a lot more metrics. Our customers uh, you know, collect many, many more metrics. With the move to the cloud, you have microservices which generate even more metrics. There's just a lot of metrics to stare at in a dashboard, right? So, so machine learning here has to be fundamental to reducing not just the noise and complexity of looking at all this data, but also extracting things that you would miss otherwise. So in all, all of these three vastly different but related areas, we are embedding machine learning fundamentally into that area. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I know we talked a little bit and you had a few examples. I think one of them was uh, one of our favorite uh, uh, makers of, of candy, uh, obviously. Mars Inc. I, I, I heard some, you know, you shared a little bit about that. I think that'd be a great example if you could provide a little context around how they're actually, you know, employing these use cases in their, in their, in their business. Yeah, so uh, there are customers who, uh, I, I'll give a simple example. So uh, practically every customer of ours, ours at some scale and beyond has to track metrics and they have to detect outliers in these metrics. Uh, we are working with a customer today who has to do this across millions of entities, and uh, we are talking about several petabytes of data a day. So when you're when you're dealing with that kind of volume and that kind of variety of data, um, outlier detection and anomaly detection and things like this have to be done on the screen. So doing it in a batch fashion on large amounts of data on a daily basis is just computationally infeasible. Uh, but more interestingly, when you try to do this on the stream, you have to be able to deal with seasonality and you know, periodicity and things like that on the stream correctly. Traditionally, this is actually done in a batch fashion. In traditional machine learning, you subtract out periodicity in data in a, by a batch algorithm. And there are no known ways of doing that online, except for the ones that we have developed. So again, here, we are essentially having to innovate in order to be able to do certain things on the stream, which are required to guarantee the same sort of accuracy you would get in outlier detection and downstream machine learning tasks but just faster than you would be able to do today. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, of course, like I said, you know, as I was kind of reading through the the case study notes uh, for for Mars, um, it looks like their challenges, you know, had a lot to do with security. Um, it's about being able to quickly extract relevancy. I mean, one of the big overarching themes of all this is is just volumes, and what's driving all this is just is just volumes. I mean. With so many different uh, attack surfaces for companies right now, with so many different streams of data. I mean, we've heard just uh, you know just recently there was a, a very very well documented uh, attack against Twitter, 
Um, and it, it ended up getting into some very large company, access to very large companies through, you know, uh, secondary control, uh, secondary surfaces where it ended up coming back because, right, they got into Twitter system then we're able to extract data and then actually access Apple's uh, uh, account. And so, you know, this is really where you're talking about volumes of data that can be looking. There's no way a human, a person can be sitting there looking at all these attack surfaces successfully. Um, so like I said, whether it's Mars, whether it's, it's, it's these others, and I know some are your customers and some aren't. I mean, really this comes down to it's volume, right? That's really what's making this this so important right now. Yeah, uh, I think with volume, uh, customers are having to do an interesting trade-off, and that is the problem that we are trying to solve. So, if, going back to that Mars example, right, with the security example, uh, in in many of these security use cases, uh, you would find that it, people are actually exploiting known exploits, right? They are actually literally doing things that are known. Uh, these are what we call signatures. Now, if you have the ability to run like millions of these signatures, you can actually catch some um, outliers, right? You can you can flag these things. But a you, the problem that you have there is just being able to do a lot of these uh, known anomaly detection uh, signature detections fast enough, right? And at, at scale, uh, even there, machine learning on the stream is uh, useful, and that's one of the things with, that we are doing in our security products is. Uh, Using the developments that we have made on uh, online learning on streams, we are scaling out how many detections we can actually do and how fast can we do them. But that's just one angle of it, right? The other other part of it is now we have a lot of low fidelity de detections, and somebody has to actually look at them and figure out what is valuable and what is uh, what is just noise. So for the second part, you still need to be able to look at all of these low fidelity kind of detections and figure out what is actually really a threat. And that requires much more sophisticated machine learning techniques. So on the one hand, you want to be able to do a lot of detections and at scale. Otherwise, you, you won't be able to catch the things that you need to catch. But on the other hand, you have to be able to filter things out to really look at the threats. So we are solving both side, both of these problems. And if you just did one or the other, you're not going to be able to solve the problem. That you need. Yeah, no question that this is going to become a bigger and bigger pressing issue. And it seems that uh, Splunk is definitely well positioned here. Uh, Tim, I want to kick it over to you. Um, with what's going on in the market as a, as a CTO, right? You're sort of always ba balancing that line between the customer interfacing and the technology interfacing, and that's it's very complex. But I always find people do really love to sort of hear what those customer interactions look like. Um, you know, with what Ram was talking about, with what Doug spoke about earlier. You know, what are you hearing as the sort of that bridge between customer and technology? Uh, what, what are customers thinking about a lot right now? Yeah, a lot of it is honestly what we're working on in, in Splunk. Obviously, cloud sort of dominates most conversations. And really, that's what Splunk is about right now is 100% cloud. Like everything we're doing from a software creation perspective is directed at the cloud, at the cloud quite honestly. Um, if, you, if you double click into that conversation, a lot of it is, hey, I'm, you know, I'm 50% on prem, 50% on, on in the cloud. At the same time, I also want to do multi-cloud at the same time because people don't want to couple themselves to any particular big public cloud vendor and they want to hedge and have sort of pricing optionality. So people are trying to think about how to balance the hybrid strategy, but also how to be multi-cloud at the same time. So it's an interesting two-dimensional problem for those folks. Uh, machine learning, obviously, is, uh, you know, it's interesting. Machine learning, in a lot of ways, when I talk to customers, I feel like it's sort of taken on a life of its own. Everyone feels a sort of like overwhelming requirement to do a lot of machine learning. But I, I think, uh, you know, there's certain there's different levels of understanding of, of what that really means. And I, I think a lot of the work that we're doing here in, in Splunk, honestly, particularly the particularly the work in the stream actually helps make machine learning more deployable and more accessible and far more intelligent than it has been in the past. Um, you know, Ram talked a lot about the notion that everything's in the stream now. Really, what you're you're moving towards is a almost a sentient machine learning world, right? Where the learning is happening continuously rather than you know stale models that sort of get, get built offline. And I think for a lot of folks, that's a lot more actually a lot more sensible of a model, right? Where you can build this machine learning that is almost behaving the way that people think it does because of science fiction and and, and other things. And we're actually we're actually there, um, thankfully with with Ron's work. 
Um, and then obviously, you know, you sort of alluded to it, a lot of questions around certainly security. Um, and then what I'm also seeing is a lot of questions around observability, um, which is, you know, as people move their sort of static monolithic applications from, you know, JVM based uh, monoliths on virtual machines or virtual appliance in the data center, they're moving towards the cloud. And so you see sort of a distribution of folks. They're either, you know, all the way on the left hand side, all the way on the right hand side or, or somewhere in between. Thankfully, a lot of the work that we're doing uh, post our acquisition of signal effects and omniscient is really lining up to satisfy those customers who have more modern applications that live in the cloud. Yeah, and, and, and you know, I've heard from you and in, in discussions we've had, Tim, and, and you, not to sound uh, you know, like you're using uh, overly cliche, but you sort of have a, a, a crawl, walk, run model that you approach. Can you just quickly touch on that? Because I think one of the things that a lot of the customers are really struggling with is how? How do I do this quickly? Uh, because everything you said is true, but that overwhelm feeling causes, you know, our, our research has shown that overwhelming feeling basically causes people instead of moving faster, they actually almost become unable to move at all. They become stuck in the cement. Yeah, the, the, crawl, the crawl approach probably is, you know, more going back to the world where, um, our security products, for example, in the way that Ram talked about, are using some of the machine learning techniques that his team is developing that are more inherent to the product and sort of just, they just sort of work without you having to do any training or data preparation or feature extraction or anything. You just sort of, you know, we make it work for you, but it's 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 under the, under the covers. Um, then there's sort of maybe the, 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 next, the next piece where, hey, you know, you're starting to do a little bit of model creation offline and then you would do things like, you know, add custom work to another thing that Ron's working on is our next generation of our user behavior analytics suite in, in security, where you're, there's more bespoke machine learning, but you're sort of, sort of still working in, in our, our environment. And then there's sort of like the last step, which is which is run, where, you know, you become a ROM somewhere and you're doing data science full time. You're using things like Jupyter and other data science workbench tools to do you know, data science, which eventually translates into some machine learning as part of your, your system. Um, I, I think Splunk's actually well suited to address all three of those, those crawl, crawl, walk, run categories. Um, but really, I see a lot of customers, honestly, I, I, to be fair, it's a sort of a distribution. And you can almost sort of divide it by sector, almost, in terms of where people will fall, and also size of organization, obviously. It's uh, it's interesting. I see sort of the the full spectrum. Yeah, it it is interesting. And you and I, the, the last thing I want to touch on here is we sort of close the session up. And by the way, gentlemen, thank you so much. Your insights have been tremendous. Um, is about a conversation, Tim. You and I had in a podcast that uh, I was had the pleasure to do with you in the past, which is kind of talking about AI versus ML, talking about what's real and what's not. Uh, so, Ram, I'm going to kick this one to you. Uh, then Tim, I might let you you layer on if you hear any if he if he doesn't cover all the ground. But as a last question, kind of a lightning round, um, talk a little bit about your stance on AI versus ML. Uh, AI is really popular. We love it. It's a great hashtag. It creates great fodder. It's a good headline. I put in my Forbes articles all the time. But you, Tim, you definitely had an opinion on this. Um, AI versus ML. How real is AI? How do you differentiate the two? Uh, give me a, a two-minute lightning round answer, Ram. Okay, uh, I tend to not use the word AI. I'm, um, I think machine learning is a very precise term. Uh, we understand what it means, and it's very easy to talk about it. AI is a little bit of a buzzword, uh, and also, you know, people have been talking about AI for like 60 years, probably more, right? Uh, but if you look back at maybe the 70s or 60s and so on, what we used to consider AI have become rule systems, right? Things that we completely well understand. Uh, I think that is going to be true of many of the things that we see over time. Uh, what what I think is uh, much more uh, robust and something that survives time is uh, machine learning. I think that's a concept that's very well defined. Uh, AI, I, I think of it as machine learning plus tooling to kind of put the user interfaces around and take feedback and things like that. Uh, to that extent, I, I can kind of get to the word AI, but I don't use it usually. It becomes like a tool, right? That say, yeah. for instance, that helps your camera focus more quickly and optimizes for light. These are little tools, but it's been a history of ML uh, that's improved and improved and improved and improved. And basically, you, it's a byproduct of ML and data yeah. that created the opportunity for the CPU to take an instruction set and do something specifically with a device that's connected to the machine. 
Yeah, that's really interesting, Tim. And I know I know you feel passionate about this. So just giving you a chance for a last word. Any any other thoughts on that particular topic? As AI continues to become the word, but ML is really what Splunk seems to be focused on. Yeah, I, I agree with Rom. I think AI is sort of a silly, <laughs> sort of like science fictiony word. Um, you know, I, I think of, of ML much more what we're doing. Although I will sort of caveat that with, you know, a lot of the innovation that's happening over in our in our ML team under ROM, you know, quite honestly, it's starting to sort of head in that direction of AI. Maybe I wouldn't call it AI, but just because we're moving to this world where the ML is learning continuously, that 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 I actually think is a huge innovative step that we're taking. Um, I'll never go all the way to calling it AI, but, you know, sort of the marketer in me with my CMO hat on, just for a moment, loves to talk about the fact that that's sort of the vector we're on. I would love to call the endpoint of AI something else, um, just so I can maintain a little bit of street cred. Uh, but you know, I, I think the takeaway for your listeners is, is hey, you know, Splunk is is doing more than what you have th- thought of as being histor- historically machine learning, where you're training models offline with potentially stale data, and moving to a world where the machine learning is learning all the time um, in, in the stream. Yeah, that's terrific. And with so many workloads, with cloud and multi-cloud architecture, the ability for uh, you know models to continually be reacting and acting upon data, real-time stream, uh, stream processing. There's a number of words, a number of our partners across this event. It'd be great next year, by the way, to do a panel, maybe even for this event, where we get uh, a group of you to debate this topic. Because um, obviously you see the architecture, I like to call it, of how AI is being presented. And I think all of you probably agree more than you disagree, but the way the the, the, the vernacular ends up getting placed into business uh, marketing and lingo uh, is so fascinating to watch. But uh, Tim and Rom, thank you so much for uh, the session. Uh, really interesting for everybody out there. Uh, really enjoy you know this trend, paying attention to the fact that machine learning is going to continue to have a bigger impact on your business as we move forward. As uh, this technology continues to to grow. It's going to be all about you being able to maximize the data in your business. I talked about that. Uh, it seems like in almost every session, whether it's about workforce culture all the way down to a very specific ML, data is going to be paramount to running our business. Forward. But for this session, uh, we're going to have to wrap up now. Again, Rom, Tim, great work, great conversation. See everyone later. Thank you. Thanks.